here with Scott Farrell, KE4WMF. And Scott has put together a amazing mobile that I'll describe as being like if Rover had mated with a hatchback. So welcome, Scott, to the show. All right. Thanks for having me. Your mobile, and you call it Stealth GTI. You have your own YouTube channel, and uh, you put together your own videos. Um, you've built up this mobile. So let me first ask you, what motivated you to do? Where, where did you start? Well, um, gosh, I, I can't believe I'm not ready for that one. Uh, I, it's a weird mixture between being a car guy and a radio guy. I had always wanted to get my license, and but I, I just wasn't studying for it. And I used to bicycle commute, so I, I was very heavily into cycling. And I came down with a case of uh, walking pneumonia one year. And so during that time when I was recovering and off the bike, I decided to study for my exam. And while I was studying, I started monitoring a nearby repeater. I felt like I was getting to know these people, even though I had never talked to them. And then I got licensed, started talking to them. And then once I was well enough to ride, I didn't want to give up talking on the radio. So I, my first station was actually a bicycle mobile station. Very cool. And so I was known as the, I even had a 30 watt amplifier on one of those little radio shack things. And so uh, I could get in from all over. They were pretty impressed with that. And then uh, eventually I, I moved the HT to my car. And of course, an HT is just never quite enough in a car. And so I have expanded from there. So I have never had a radio set up in my house. I've always been mobile. And over time, I mean, I've got a place to set up a radio at home now, but being a mobile is just my shtick. So I keep on doing it. Very good. And so when you started building things up onto your car, and, and I know I went through a process of how could I put that on my car or how could I use that in my car? Um, where did you start? HF, VHF? Can you run through a quick evolution of, of how it came together? And we're all uh, in your car right behind you in your background. Sure, sure. Uh, well, it was it was always about just a dual band. Actually, I had a, do I have a dual band radio? Uh, my first radio was just two meters and then a dual band, but I never used 70 centimeters with it. So it was always two meters. And the moniker Stealth GTI is because I always hid everything. And so my very first radio was a little, I don't know if you remember the Yesus FT90R, but it was just yeah. a little tiny marketed as the world's smallest high powered dual bander or something like that but it would fit inside of my ashtray so it was really cool i could just close the ashtray and leave the car and it didn't look like it had radios in it so i really prided myself on having the capability packed into the car that i do with everything either being quickly removable or hideable and it doesn't even look like a radio platform and and so from there Gosh, I decided to go with the Scorpion antenna because I wanted to, I, I did ATAS, but I I like the ATAS well enough, but because it doesn't perform very well on two meters, I never mounted the ATAS antenna on my car unless I was only going to do HF. Okay. So I decided to try the Scorpion and that's way too big for my car, but so what? I went for it anyway. It was uh, 2020. A lot of us got bored in 2020 <laughs> and so uh i did i did the scorpion and it was the goal there was i can still just slip it out of the hitch put it in the garage and go back to being stealth and that was my thing for a while and then later i don't remember if it was your car but between your rover and somebody else's i thought gosh if i were going to try contesting Roving is natural for me because I'm only a mobile operator. So I, I then went to um, the, the horizontal loops, which are uh, I don't even know if I can point properly. So right about there on the car, I went with those. They were it was the fastest, cheapest way for me to get onto single sideband. And I think when I put those up, I knew I wanted to get the beams because I was heavily inspired by. Uh, K5 NDs set up. I was going to ask you if, because it looks very similar to his setup in terms of. Yeah. Um, 
I, I knew I wanted to do that, but time and money was an, a, a factor. Uh, production delays as a result of all the shutdowns and everything. So I, these loops were the fastest way to get on the air and the easiest. So, cause I knew I could just slap them on, no sweat, no real engineering or thinking involved with it. And so I did that. I, I did last year's so it's a July contest, the, the CQ Worldwide VHF contest. Yep. And and I had limited success. Most of it was because of my own operating practices. I was still trying to figure out how to do things. And then I knew at that point, I was wondering, what am I not hearing? Because the Yagis, a lot of people, when they think of the Yagis, they think, oh, yeah, I'm going to just blast my power out and get farther, reach farther, and completely forget about the fact that those Yagis help you hear more in that direction and so i wanted to know what i was not hearing and that that motivated me to get onto the yogis and so then i went to the yogis and i i didn't i wasn't sure if i was going to run both loops and yogis i see that you do and uh kyle uh ka5d is that his call yes he has uh he on his van at the time he had loops and beams i don't think he drove with the beams he set them up but I thought, okay, let me run with them both. And <laughs> this friend of mine, I actually had a plan for some satellite stuff too. I was going to get some egg beaters on the car, but I, I don't think I'm going to use them very much. But anyway, my friend, uh, Tracy says, um, uh, K4 RBR. She says, uh, Scott, when you do this, you have to take at least one ridiculous photo with everything on the car. And th there it is. This right here behind me is it. <laughs> and I, I can't, I can't really operate with all of that up there because just rotating the beams will impact the ATAS that's up there. They'll, they'll collide. And so this is just an exhibition setup. It's that one ridiculous photo. And that turned into, let me take these to Hamventions and do some exhibitions with them. And it turned out to be a really big hit. I was surprised. I hadn't been to a, a this, my first one was Hamcation and I hadn't been to a Hamvention of any sort and 25 years and so uh, i had no idea it was going to take off the way it did so here we are <laughs> i well i can speak from experience unique vehicles like that certainly garner attention and um and typically i'll say there's a lot of the classic porcupine type vehicles you know a bunch of vhf whips just sticking out and maybe a bunch of radios but i find vehicles like yours mine have a totally different and and other rovers have totally different character because you see it's it's not just a bunch of repetition but you see different intent and use of all of this different hardware on a vehicle which i think just draws people and then, then they wonder how the heck does it survive on the road um do you want to talk a little bit about on on the road experiences? You, you know, I don't on the roads that I choose to drive on. Uh, I don't have too many problems with it. Uh, one of the common problem questions that I got from Hamcation visitors was, "How often do you get pulled over for this?" And it, it hasn't happened yet, uh, not while driving. I've been stopped, not stopped. I've been questioned by officers while I'm parked somewhere because they're curious or they get a a report of a suspicious vehicle or something but it it never goes off into anything but i've never been pulled over and i'm okay with that it the only time i have trouble is if i go into a park or cities you might be able to relate to this you know the cities they put in these cute little landscaping trees and they look beautiful when they're first when they're first yeah. planted and then they grow out like this and catch the sides of my mocks on up there they scrape up rvs and trucks and things and those trees turn out to be a real hassle and so you i find myself dodging them if i'm on a six lane divided road cool i get right in the middle lane and i know now why trucks do that because they get all beat up by the landscaping trees and so uh, uh i figure if um i try to stay on the roads that the trucks can drive if if i can do that then i'm i'm usually okay same here. Now, my local roads here in New Jersey, um, oh my gosh, there, there's so much overgrowth on the roads. And trucks at least will brush it away. Um, 
but on the less traveled roads, particularly in the spring, and there's a lot of new growth, it just mm -hmm. hangs down. And okay, what a truck might, may brush away will just bend elements on an antenna, as you know. And um, particularly if it's rained recently and those leaves are wet, that's what I Yeah, find. yeah. It brings the branches down even lower. Yeah. So it's both a hassle. What's what's your uh, your height? Uh, 11 and a half feet. So 11 feet, six inches. Okay. I, I suspect that's a little shorter than yours. Yeah, I'm, I'm my Yaggies are 12 feet mm -hmm. uh, at the top of that. And then I got about six inches more whip above that, which I'm less concerned about. Um, Very seldom do I hit anything center of, of the mast. Uh, you know, I, I've got this one video shooting up where I go under some trees and I, I mean, I, I, I hit it pretty good. Usually what happens is I scrape the sides of the moxon and then that those little branches that just grab that thing and pull it and then it winds up twisting it. And then I, I just grab one of my I got a camera tripod and I just reach up there and I can just move it back and get back into position. But uh, it's, it's usually grabbed from the sides. Very seldom do I have problems overhead because I've gotten OK at judging height it's the side stuff that gets me yeah okay and and obviously the moxon is it looks to me a little bit wider than your car it is my car is if i'm remembering right it's a little over six feet i want to say it's like six yeah 73 inches i think is fender to fender that doesn't include the mirrors and the moxon is seven feet and so i I overhang probably about six or seven inches on each side of the car at the front fender. Of course, the car is narrower as you go back. And that's about a foot and a half above your Yagi? Your two meter? Oh, yes. Um, 13 inches. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, with that up high, that Yagi is low enough to keep it out of the way in most most cases, particularly if you have it stowed forward. Um position like like i do when not using it's just a lower drag yes so some people may ask this question i know the answer but um why the six meter mocks on at the very top than two meters and 70 centimeters rather than say the reverse order some of that came from uh, it was something that i kind of discovered as i was putting on the the loops those are m squared loops and so i was trying to manage my overall height with those at first and i was kind of surprised just initially until i realized oh that makes sense but they have this minimum height over the roof and so the 70 centimeters was this much and then two meters was this much and six meters was the one that had to be the highest and i was like oh that totally makes sense you know bandwidth and getting it cleared and so i viewed it as higher frequencies have a better tolerance of being closer to the roof and so it, at first i think i might have been thinking oh i need a quarter wavelength or i need a well a half is i think out of the question on my little thing but uh, it that's what got me to go on all right lowest frequency up highest and highest frequency down lowest because it can tolerate being closer to the car exactly and and another way to look at it too is your your elevation angle or radiation is related to to how far above the ground you are in terms of wavelengths or a proportion of a wavelength. And so on 70 centimeters, it's easy to get height above the ground. Two meters is more difficult. Six meters is very difficult on any kind of mobile install. So that's why yours, mine, so many other rovers, actually, you see the lower frequency antennas up higher. And I, I have my microwave ones really, really low. Yeah, I get asked that sometimes from club members why I've done it that way. Because in, in their minds, yeah, get that UHF up as high as you can for the best line of sight. And I, I completely look at it as interaction or interference with the body of the car. So uh, the higher frequencies tolerate it better than the lower ones. So yeah, six meters to the top. Yeah, and in practice, when you're looking at the heights you can get on a mobile, um 12 feet versus nine feet isn't making a big difference on line of sight no yeah 
because of your setup there, how do you monitor that or know that you've got enough clearance to get under? Like if you have a questionable branch or something to go under, how do you estimate or judge that you can get under that? Do you have um, any tricks? I guess what is my question. Uh, unfortunately, no, because uh, I, I the video that I shared with you where it shows me hitting those trees, I really thought that I was going to make it. And I hit branches. What it really probably was was just noise transmitting through the rack and into the car. And it just scared me half to death. And it felt like that tree just stopped the car dead in its tracks. I thought for sure I had buckled the roof or bent something and there was no damage at all, but it, it spooked me severely. And so in the video that you have, I'm actually leaving through a different entrance. I'm going backwards through a, a shallower with a higher tree and I still scraped. And so, uh, yes, I, realistically that impact was very light and I just barely grazed the trees probably they're probably only three inches lower than my moxon was but that's very tough to gauge and so i typically underestimate so am i saying that right yeah i underestimate the height of the trees so that i can be a little more nervous around them and i i guess i do okay with that and like i said it's the side scrapes to get me because a little hatchback like that it's fun to drive and so my hazard is urban roads um, some parking lots that have the little landscaping trees in them. I got to stay away from them all together. And believe it or not, exit ramps. When I take an exit ramp. Sometimes I take it a little fast and then I dive in and I'm too close to the shoulder and I hit a tree off to the side like that. So I got to be careful there too. So, uh, you know, if I hit something and it's my fault, I'm not going to be too, I'll be a little upset about damaged mast or damaged antennas, but I really don't want to damage the car. And so uh, I, I, I'm fairly careful, except for, I guess, what I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I never forget it's up there, but sometimes it's easy to misjudge height. Yeah, I, I unfortunately cheat. I have a sunroof, and I can see mine through the sunroof. Yeah, uh, well, you mentioned the camera, and I don't have a camera on the car full time. I was just shooting some B-roll to share with some of my videos, and realistically even if i had a full-time camera there by the time that camera sees anything it's too late it's it's good if i think uh, let me see if i can squeak through and i'll go nice and slow and when i see the contact i have to decide do i want to go ahead and let it roll on through and flap 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 or do i want to say oops and back up and go around but i i don't have that capability i just try to i just try to miss it all the time well, that's exactly what I do, by the way. When I see a real question, I'll slow down and I'll start looking up and look for that contact or clearance. And if it's good, I'll, I'll go through. If not, although I have one crazy video going under a tunnel that's signed eight foot, 10 inches or eight foot, eight inches. Mm -hmm. um, but it's got a high arc arch on it. And it just kind of fits. Of course, after coming through that tunnel, there was a low wire that skimmed across the Yagi. And I had a camera up there at the time. And you hear it go. It sounds like. I did not know it hit until I actually looked at the recording. And I was like, holy cow. Oops. <laughs> yeah. There's this one tunnel. Uh, I drive the Colonial National Historic Parkway out here in Yorktown and Jamestown frequently. And there's a tunnel there. And and I had the full setup on the car and it was also dark, but I remembered that the height of the tunnel is 12 feet, six inches. So I'm like, I'm good. What I forgot is that's 12 feet, six inches in the middle and off to the sides because it's round. It says 10 feet, six. Oops. And I probably could have made it if I stayed in the middle of the lane and straddled the double yellow and just drove through the middle. I, I probably could have made it, but no, I didn't want to be that guy holding up traffic, damaging anything in the tunnel. As it was, I was that guy that stopped and had to wait for traffic to pass so that I can pull a U-turn and you know a three-point turn on this little three-lane road to avoid the tunnel. But I'd much rather do that than block the tunnel because I hit something and got stuck. 
I've got a bunch of pictures that you shared with me. You want to kind of walk walk through these a little bit? Sure. You know, we got your QSL card. And uh, next one here is a little cartoon. <laughs> yeah, that's a car-related cartoon because a lot of us, when we modify our cars for power, looks, or whatever, it's for some of us, if you ask us, hey, tell me about your car. Yeah, you get comfortable because I'm going to talk for a little while. And and the next one here, this looks like, uh, is this it in the showroom? It is. Yeah, they uh, they they moved it into the showroom for me so I could get that picture. I, I've i never done the, the last new car I bought before this one. I wasn't as much of a car guy. So now with this one, I was like, oh, let me get a start to finish thing. That one, what I'll point out there is that is, say, the the peak of the Stealth GTI, because I have a black and I have a black dual band antenna on top of the car. You just can't see it, and so that was my point. Is yes, this car has a dual band radio in it, and occasionally HF. It's packed with capability, but you can't even tell by looking at it. That was what I was so pleased with, with the Stealth GTI, and of course, Stealth is blown now. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. All right, now we got uh, your shifter here over by uh, your icon. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, an interesting photograph uh, composition with the, the the radio, the gear shift, and the plaid. And it looks cool, but it's not very practical because as I would row through the gears, I would touch the touch screen and mess things up, so I had to move it. In that photo, one of the things I'm capturing is that I have routed the cabling through the ventilation. Okay. I like to hide, like I said, I like to hide all those things. And so my cabling all goes through the vents to keep them out of sight. And so visible cable runs in my setup is minimal. And this looks like a mount for a couple radios, I think. Yes. Um, what what that is, is it, that is the one is the mount for the ID5100. I liked the magnetic mount of it. So if I go to a hotel, I can just pull it off and take it with me. And so in order to hold the extra weight of two radios, I went ahead and bought a second one. And that now I've got four magnets holding the two radios up. And so that was just showing that. And then that it's it's all screwed to a pro clip mount. And, and, and right here in the next photo, we see the two radios mounted on. Yes. On that. Yep. And I have some glue actually helping to hold that up because the pro clip mount alone is not strong enough to hold the radio. So I've actually glued it. Uh, to the to the dash. Okay, and here I see you've what looks like you've built a shade around the the radio. Yes, that is just a uh, what's the proper size four by six index card box, and then I just shaved it to fit around uh, my blinker stock and part of the steering wheel, I think. And next one here, it looks like uh, you're out at a beach. I see one little tiny whip antenna and. A little round antenna on the back. Um, yeah, that little one is a uh, WeBoost cellular signal booster that I was okay. playing with. I still have it, but at the time I was playing with the little shark fin there. And then uh, moving on, it looks like mount for your scorpion on the uh, trailer hitch. Yes, this one here is just showing a little bit of the, the choke and the motor connection. And, and then this one here shows my bonding and inside of the box is my shunt coil. And so the next one here, you show an eight foot, six inch clearance. Yes, that's a, it's a drive through that I frequent. And uh, that's what I like about having the cap hat is I still fit. People get really nervous when they see me go through there because I don't even slow down. I just blow right under that sign. But I have to be tuned for 17 meters because if I'm tuned for 20, I might scrape. If I'm tuned for 40, I definitely will scrape. So I have to make sure I park the antenna before I go through there. And now we've got one with uh, your, it looks like M squared square loops on. That was that was my very first setup for the last year's July uh, VH, CQ VHF, what's called CQ Worldwide VHF contest. Right. And so quick and dirty, six and two meters. And that was how I rolled out and I can't remember if it's, uh, yeah, one of these future photos, you'll see how I routed the coax in through a window. And uh, you show the mount, how that's mounted the roof rack. Pretty straightforward. And okay. And then you route the wire in through 
a window visor and the window partly open. So that looks like my trick. Yes, or, there's a piece of pipe insulation in there to to keep the whistling down and to keep the antenna from being or the coax from being squished in there. And so here I've got what do I have? Six of my eight ports being used. And so I switched the the upper ones are for my horizontal loops and the lower ones are for my my yogis and i've got a switch inside that lets me switch between the two moving on interior view one of them they look straight and the other one looks like it has 90 degree yes um it's not it's not shown in the photo but of the 90 degree ones i've got a it's a factory privacy shade that snaps into these clips you can see the clips along the the, the window frame and so with the 90 degree ones i'm able to put that factory privacy shade back into place and it, it keeps the cables closer to the door which makes it neater for opening and closing because i think in the previous photo you might have saw the dometic refrigerator there so i i do get back there sometimes for some snacks and so keeping the cables out of my way is good yeah that's good i pretty much try not to open the door on my feed side at all mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what i appreciate about having the pass through there is i can use my door because I've got a first aid kit down there and my uh, my roadside emergency kit is all down there. So I, I do use the door. Okay. And so here we got one at some sort of dam or lake. Um, yeah, there's a dam there. I, this is kind of a, a POTA setup. I was going to a car show. And so I said that Hamcation was my first ham radio exhibit at a ham show i didn't tell you that i had been taking it to car shows and so i i've been showing volkswagens for probably 20 years and as my it, it, at first i was showing the stealth radio setup so people had to look in the car before they realized oh wow what is this stuff or the guys who are really into it they might look at my mount on the roof and say well that's not factory what is that but then once I started getting a little nutty with this stuff, this I did a POTA activation, a couple of POTA activations. I drove on the tail of the dragon. That's a very popular, famous uh, road where you can get your car photographed and everything. I'll share a photo of, of the car running through there. But this is basically the car set up and I showed it like this. And so I, that that was when I started making these radio exhibitions with the signs and everything so people could see what was really going on in there. And so uh -huh. uh, this is my traveling POTA slash VW show setup. Okay. And here we got one running through uh, a forested area. <laughs> yes. Uh, that was out in West Virginia. I was activating a, a bunch of parks. A friend and I were doing, uh, we're trying to do this, what do they call it? rapid right radar, radar rapid deployment thing and it was it, it's based on activities or movement i should say so moving from park to park and so i was looking for this park and i wound up on this little dirt road and i got all the way down this this double track road and i got to this point to where just about anything else could have made it across this little this little water crossing but my car is too low it, there, it had a rock crossing and there was no way i was going to get across that so i had to back it all the way out and of course my backup camera is blocked by the scorpion and so i had to just drive it backwards until i found a place that was just barely wide enough for me to do about a 100 point turnaround to get the car turned around and then drive however many miles it was to get all the way back out of there so yeah that was an adventure uh I, and i got the car plenty dirty i a, a bigger not a bigger vehicle a more capable vehicle with more ground clearance would have been way better for that particular exhibition yeah i can imagine and and i'll say i one of the things that motivated me in my mobile particularly the hf side of it and i'll go from focusing on the hf to focusing on the 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 roving was national parks on the air that was mm -hmm. a big motivating thing i haven't really done parks on the air um Although I could do it, it's just a matter of time. And yeah. So let's see what we got. So now we're here by a lake, sunset. Yeah, it's another, I, I shouldn't have even shared it. It's just a repeat of something I'd already shown you. So this is just, yeah, the, the, another photo of of my two bands, six and two meter setup. Now oh. we got a <laughs> Starbucks. Um, 
I suspect they do it all over the place, but uh, sometimes they call these doodles. And so uh, they'll doodle something, have a nice day, or they'll put a flower on it or something like that. And uh, these baristas at this shop, they they know me. And apparently they know me very well if they take the time to draw that on, <laughs> on one of my bags. And so I got a chuckle out of that. It kind of made my day. I think I eventually took the bag back in and said, hey, I want to know who drew this. And they thought that I was going to complain. I said, no, I just want to know who it is so I can see them and let them know they made my day. So it was kind of funny. The whole shop got a chance to see that. And I think they even shared it on their web page. And so, uh, yeah, it was good for a laugh. Cool. All right. Now we've got one with a little bit more going on here. Yeah, this is almost the whole kitchen sink kind of thing. Uh, this is everything short of the Yagi's. And I guess kind of a funny story behind this photo was my club was doing a uh, a murder mystery and I was the victim. And so they wanted me to, they, they, they somehow wanted to tie the car into the whole thing. But of course I can't, I can't shoot a picture of me lying on the ground dead and have a picture of the car. So I took a picture of the car with me for the opening of this thing. Cause here's my, here's the victim. And then later they, they took this picture that was of me laying on the ground pretending to be dead and they edited in way too much blood. Whatever happened to me, it was gruesome. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's kind of a funny story behind this photo, but I also use this photo as uh, profile photos and some of my stuff. Cool. And look, there's the Yagi sitting on the, on the ground. Yes. This is uh, this is K five ND's setup. Okay. And so this is where I got my inspiration from. So he's got uh, all four bands of the limited rover category there. And so that was uh, that was where I got my start. And uh, I, I got to say, there's some things I like about his setup better than mine. And I can maybe speak to that later if the, if it, if it seems to come up. But uh, yeah, that's that's where it all started. OK, well, I have to say those are nice, shiny antennas he's got there. They are. <laughs> They are. I don't think his spend nearly as much time outside as yours do. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, and this is Jim's car again. Yes. In this case, I can see he's only got two or three of the four bands mounted. So this must have been before he got on 222. And this one looks familiar. That is uh, K5ATX. Yes. His uh, new car. Tim. Tim. Yeah. Um, I shared this with you to say that I considered using a hitch mounted setup like this. Um, some of the ones that I've seen are not terribly sturdy. Uh, I think I could guy one to my roof rack and make it okay as far as sturdiness goes. But the problem here is uh, you can see he's got this little red tape taped on there or tied on there. And I think in Texas that is sufficient it's legal in virginia it's not once you make it to four feet behind the bumper of the car it has to have a 12 by 12 inch flag on it and since some of my roads take me into north carolina north carolina requires an 18 by 18 inch flag and i have no idea what that does to aero drag or swr of the affected antenna so i decided to keep everything on the roof yeah yeah well, and his setup here, of course, is he's got to point the car, which is a, a very common setup for rovers. Mm -hmm. And is this your mount now? This one? Yeah, this is mine. So I, I took a slightly different approach from Jim. Um, he used uh, setups that you key together and, and, and screw together where I, I had flanges welded and, and built my, my um, I call it a micro tower. So I built mine just a little bit different than his. And then if you move on to the next one, you can see the decking board. This is it assembled upside down. So you can see that I uh, I used I used excessive hardware on mine. Those those flanges have half inch holes in them and I didn't want there to be any slop. So I use half inch hardware to fasten it to the boards. Okay. And so uh, that's probably the strongest part of the whole thing. Uh, and then the next photo shows it right side up. Yeah. And then test fit. And then uh, from there, it just, you know, you can see I've got a PVC pipe in there. And that's just, I, I use that when I transit without the mast in place. 
uh, the PVC pipe is sticking out of the top of the rotator. I do that just so I can tighten the hardware up and not have any of it rattle loose when I'm driving without the mass installed. And so it's just there okay. for, for hardware retention. And then the next photo is, that's the same one that's right behind me here. So uh, I, I kind of like this shot. The fog was just right. There was nobody there bugging me. And uh, that's the hardest part about shooting a video. I shot a video that day. And for days prior to that, I'd go out to this location and try to shoot a video because it's, there's not a lot of people there, but they sure show up when you break out a camera and start talking to it. Then everybody wants to know what it is. And I love talking about the car, but not when I'm trying to get a video done. So uh, this day it had rained all night and you can see the ground is still wet. And so nobody was there. I just shot a video and it was nice. And then I took some shots. People also do not appreciate the fact that antennas do not stand out with a lot of different backgrounds. You've got to get the right background to, to see them properly. That's why I did all of my shooting here. I didn't want any trees in the background. So I was going to water locations and this is the easiest one for me to access with relative privacy. Yeah. And and the, the gray is just enough contrast, water location, sky, um, open sky. But as soon as you get power lines, trees, <laughs> you start losing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And now we've got the annotated version. Yes. Now, I, I, I'm i going to poke a little bit of fun at you. I noticed in all and in, in almost every video I've ever seen you talking in, you always talk about uh, two meters, six meters, 1.25 meters. And there comes this point where it's like, how many meters? I just can't track all that. I I wanted to make a diagram that um, that hams and non-hams alike could kind of relate to a little bit. And so I stuck with common terms no 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 metrics <laughs> in this this is all frequencies what i'm trying to show in this picture here is the close proximity between the 432 and the capacitance hat i cannot tune uh, 80 meters and, and i think even 40 with the cap hat with my yagi's mounted it's 20 meters and, and 17 only uh, with the cap actually i think i can tune 40 yes i can tune 40 meters 40 meters is my bread and butter band with this antenna but 80 meters out of the question i can't tune it with the yagis up they interfere too much i find my yagi positioning makes a a big difference of course on tuning now i can pretty much tune the bands regardless of which way the Yag yagis are pointed as long as i don't move the yagis once i've tuned now you're showing uh, some shackles here to, and are these magnets that it goes to? They're suction cups. Suction those, cups. Yeah, those are made by a company called Sea Sucker. And so they started off with um, uh, marine products. I had misspoke in another video where I said that they started off with bicycle stuff. That's just the first place I ever saw them. Uh, imagine, say, an exotic car that does not have a roof rack. Well, Sea Sucker makes roof racks for these cars that cannot otherwise have a rack. And so I've seen them with bicycles and skis and all kinds of things. And then they got into, well, they've always been into marine, but then they got into the overland community, which if you're not familiar with that term, those are the, the off-roaders, campy, camper types, adventure seekers and things like that. And so uh, I thought, well, let me buy one of these Sea Suckers and then I will find a way to adapt a a ring to it or something and then it turned out they didn't have to they supplied them just like that with the d ring right on them and so each sea sucker can support it can hold down with 210 pounds of force wow uh, it at an angle like that you you know you take the sign of that and that really comes out to about half so but even 100 pounds of force holding it in place it it does provide some stability so when i take those crazy corners um it I can hear it kind of flexing a little bit up there because the uh, up there where the turnbuckles, not the yeah, where the turnbuckles go into those rings at the uh, what is that called? A tower table shelf at the tower shelf. Okay. I can hear some noise transmit through, so I know when things are flexing up there. Uh, so they are those guys are providing a little bit of stability, but my primary reason for having them there would be. If I hit that tree limb that breaks something, which now that I've hit one, I know that it's stronger than I thought. And I also wonder if I hit a 
say a 15 pound turkey vulture that was in the middle of the road when I came around the turn and it flies straight up. What kind of force is that going to hit with? And so my hope is first that I don't have that happen, but second would be that if I break the hardware on the car, that at least one of those four guys will hold on to things long enough for me to get the car stopped <laughs> to the side of the road without things launching into somebody else's car. So the next one we've got here, it looks like you're actually mounting it on the vehicle. Yes, uh, I had been through some experiments to see what worked best. And so I think at that point, um, I was experimenting with lifting the whole thing up to the edge of the rack and then resting it on that ladder. So that's what the ladder is doing there. Another nice, nice photo here. Yes, another one of the uh, ridiculous everything on it photos, but I, I don't. I don't just take a photo unless I can get a good sunrise or sunset. So there's my sunset photo. Moving on to the next photo. This this is an awesome looking night photo that you put together here. Oh, yes, yes. So photography, another hobby of yours by any chance? It, it is. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, most of the photos that I take are of the car, car or landscape. And so, uh, I, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. What do we got here? It looks like you're you're indoors. This is uh, Rars Fest. It's a ham fest in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ah, this it's, is the one that wanted me to come this year. Did they? They are really trying to kick off their uh, their MCOM, in MCOM and say um, mobile stuff because they want they want to show their visitors possibilities. And so that's another thing that I'm doing here. Not only am I just doing an exhibition of the car but I am presenting possibilities. Not that everybody's going to go nutty and just feel their cars, cars full of radios, but if I can do this, then you can do a dual bander or you can do HF. And so there was me and one other MCOM vehicle there. He was like at a converted ambulance or something like that. And so they, they would really like to see more mobiles. I've got plenty of room to get probably five vehicles along that row there. And there were two of us. And so I, I think I'll be invited back again next year because they want to they want to get more stuff like that in there to show possibilities. Next couple photos, we got a, another photo and I see a close up. Uh, you've got a little antenna radiator at the front that looks like a small Moxon. Yes, this junior. is I call this I call this my compact setup. And so. I participate in six and two meter nets on the weekends. And so that's why oftentimes my, my, uh, my loops are just on the car almost all the time now, but I decided I wanted to experiment with directivity. Let's see if I can get a little bit more performance. So I got my hands on this two meter Moxon to test out on a shorter mass. And so I can still make it through my drive throughs with this setup and everything. And, you can see I got a different thrust bearing on this, and then I'm still using my suction cup guys. So I don't have the full micro tower, but with something this small, I don't need it. And uh, yeah, so this is just a, another optional setup. I might use this on the uh, the CQ VHF contest that's coming up. So not as much gain as my Yagi's, of course, but it's convenient. So I, I haven't decided. I'm feeling a little lazy, and with it being so hot out, I don't know if I want to do all the work to get it all up on the roof and everything. But uh, I don't know. I'm still undecided. I have, what, four days to figure that out? <laughs> this other picture, you can see how I've got the whole thing turned sideways. Yeah. And so that allows me to, of course, not have any overhang. So I don't have to worry about trees or drive through windows or anything. And I, I didn't mention it earlier, but I'm looking to replace that stressed Moxon with uh, that, that, two meter Yagi, excuse me, the two meter Moxon is made by Sal Electronics and their six meter antenna. The thing I like about it is it's, it's all metal. There's no just wire in or anything like that. And it's supported in the middle of the antenna, which means that if it's turned sideways like this, it's centered over the car. And I, I like that. And so uh, I have it. I just haven't assembled it yet. Now we've got an antenna that looks like you've set up for some vertical operation. Yes, uh, I do some event support with my club. And one of the, this, this particular event was, I think, for a bike MS event. And so this particular location is 
right on the fringe of repeater coverage and some you can't hit it with an ht and so they had me out there because i'm mobile right so i can use full power or not full power but I, i'm on 50 watts right and so 50 watts was enough in the morning but for some reason once that sun is up and over i don't know what it is but it doesn't work at all so then i i put together this yaki setup so that i can hit it from you know from there with the yaki so now i've got an antenna that's higher up in the air and it's pointed straight at the repeater and i'm walking around with an ht at 100 milliwatts and hitting the repeater like i'm standing right next to it and so uh uh, so it's doing a crossband repeat function for me, and it's been very effective. We've got a picture that looks like a beach. That, uh, yep, that was during the June contest. I was out at Chincoteague National, though I'm going to mess up that that the name of that park, but this is the, the seashore in Chincoteague Island, wild ponies and all that other stuff. I didn't see any of them, but uh, got out there on the beach and was hoping to shoot a signal across the ocean to Long Island. And uh, I didn't make any Long Island contacts, but I, I did okay, I guess. Okay. And there you've got it turned a little bit on the, mm -hmm. down the road. And I and I know we've got some video footage that we'll, we'll share of, of doing some of that action. Hey, this is Scott. I'm going to just share a quick video of my tower in action. If you look closely, I am rotating the beams here. As the camera car rotates around here in front of me so at this point i'm pointing completely backwards check this out as i run over some railroad tracks you can see how stable everything is and now i'm rotating the beams toward the front here's another look of the antenna sweeping counterclockwise so i started at the furthest most stop which is all the way backwards and pointing slightly past center line and all i'm doing is just uh, i'm pressing the left lever to point to make the antenna train to the left so you can see i'm coming through to zero nine zero right now and bringing my way back around to zero 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 and that would be relative of course if you're a nautical type there's true north which is zero 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 and then there's relative which is relative to the bow or in my case the front bumper so here i am passing through zero 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 and wrapping on back around to uh to my left and so here i am approaching 270 and i will continue to swing around to the back and now the antenna is pointing straight back and uh, the rear of it's in the wind and here i am at the other stop going the other direction so there is a little bit of overlap and so there it is and now i go ahead and bring it back And there I am sitting. I, it's very easy to overshoot zero a little bit, and then I bring it back over a little bit. So that there is pretty much the beams pointed straight ahead. If you look close, you can see my pass through there. Uh oh, what happened here? You messy back of the car. Yes, this is. Uh, yeah, this is during the overhaul, and so I was removing everything and sorting out all the wires because. I don't know, you might be able to relate to this. You put something in and then later you add something, the wires go in and then you add something else, the wires go in. And before you know it, you've got a jumbled up mess. And when you go, when I went to move things around, I, I needed to untangle all the wires. And so I just, re I removed everything from the car, but this is, this is after I dismounted all the equipment, but I had not yet pulled all the wires out so you can see a couple of radio chassis sitting there in the back of the car and then of course tools and cables everywhere and eventually i took all of that stuff and strung it out the rear passenger door to put it all in the straight lines and unravel it into the yard and then uh, methodically put it all back into the car labeling everything so that i knew what it was for and then uh, made everything pretty tidy And there's forced ventilation under the whole thing. 
And so I don't remember if I've showed a picture yet. There'll be one when you see the battery. You'll be able to see some fans that I have in the area up in the front. And they blow air through the whole thing to, uh, I guess you could say to cool it. The hottest I've ever seen it get under there was around 140 degrees. But I was doing a torture test when I did that. I was keyed up continuously on one of my uh, radios just to see how long it took to to reach that temperature. And that was without the ventilation. With the ventilation running, it never exceeded 110 degrees. And so I'm I'm very pleased with the way the ventilation works. And here we've got a photo of um, your some of your wire hookups and your uh, uh, coax relays. Oh, yes. Yeah. So remember, I showed those doors that one of them was open and the other one was closed. And so this is one of those doors opened. And so the coax, and you can see two of the fans there, those coax switches are what I use to switch between the Yagi's and the loops. And there's a switch, it's right behind me. You can't quite see it in the photo because it's black, but it's right behind me. And I just reach down and I just click it up or down, depending on whether I want the Yagi's or the or the loops. And that's, that's what all of those are for. So I have... Uh, four bands worth of relays there. So right now, one of them is kind of a spare because I don't have 222 yet, but it's 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 all built and ready for 222 when I make the move. And then above it is the bottom of the door as it closes. And so you can see the main relay for turning on the power to everything and uh, my WeBoost cellular signal booster. Those are the two major components that you can spot in there. And then a fuse panel, of course. Yeah. I use um, similar RF relays, a slightly different model than that, but I use them for exactly what you're doing, the switch between the Omnis and the Yaggies. I like your relays better because they're they're more compact. Mine, my, mine stand out more and they take up more space. And so I didn't notice that until I already had them on hand. I thought I was ordering something very close to what you show in yours because how many different variations can there be, right? But uh, yeah, they, yeah, it's either they're a the, little different. The output ports come straight out, or they have the ninety degrees on it. Mm -hmm. which is, yeah, the big difference. So now we're in a. We got some blue boxes here, and uh, one that that clearly has a heat sink. What what are we looking at? The bigger blue box that is my lithium uh, iron phosphate battery. So that's a one hundred amp hour lithium battery. The radios run off of that exclusively. They don't run off of auto power at all. Okay. And then the smaller blue box is the Orion TR Smart Charger. So that is a DC to DC charger. And it's doing three things. Uh, the first thing it's doing is it's isolating the starter battery from that battery. So they, they can't feed off of each other. Right. It is um, limiting my charge current to 30 amps it, it cannot draw no matter how much i'm pulling off of that little off of that lithium battery i cannot take more than 30 amps away from my alternator while the car is running and it's usually much less than that because uh, that that thing gets hot once it heats up the the charging current comes down to say 22 amps instead and so it's very safe for the car and then the last thing it's doing is it's a true battery charger so it's going through all the the stages of charging and i always forget what they are i think it's bulk i forget the middle one all the time bulk and float are the ones on the end the one in the middle absorption that's what that one's called so bulk absorption and float and and then it'll do a trickle while it's in float mode so it's a, it's a true battery charger not just a power supply okay so, and you can see the fans on that side too so one of the fans is pulling air straight through those heat sinks because like i said it gets hot i have a charger charge controller that limits for my auxiliary battery the charge rate to 20 amps. However, when I'm in a contest, I'm using way too much power and I just literally bridge the batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, both both are lead acid. I wouldn't do mixed types. Like, like if I was using uh, the lipos like you've got here, um, I, I wouldn't bridge them together. Well, and that's, that's what the, that's what this charger is doing is it's, it's put in the proper voltage to the lithium battery. So even if my alternator is outputting 13.8, that battery is seeing 14.6. So it, it steps it up and makes it proper. Yep, understand whatever whatever it needs. So we've got a, one of the D 
distribution here. And then we've got one with the little desk on your wheel. And isn't this guy? Oh, yes, you've got the same one. I got this for my birthday this past week. What I'll point out about this particular photo is uh, I, I have a new lower desk that I had created for my uh, for my rotator. I didn't like the way I have a bigger desk. It's in this photo in here somewhere later. And it, I didn't like the positioning of it. So I created this desk to be low profile and to put my rotator right where all I had to do is just reach across and I could just, it's very natural for me to reach over and just I operate the, the levers. And it's it's not as awkward as the other position that I think you'll see in a moment. Okay. And there's one focusing on the rotator and the HF controller. Mm -hmm. And okay, we're looking from the other side. You've yeah, like it's a little kid's tote. <laughs> the one thing I did I did miss about having my bigger desk in there is the filing area. So I got this so that I could put keyboards and files and things like that. And is this your your other desk you were talking about? Yes. And so I I either I think in this photo the rotator is inside the little cabinet under the desk. And so I have to crane my head down and I can't quite see the rotator and so it's not it's not a, a very good operating position for it at all sure it holds it but i can't use it as effectively and safely uh, with with the bigger desk and so what i another thing i missed from this desk was having a the swivel of the laptop because i just thought to myself well, i don't use the laptop i just bring it out and i log or whatever and then i decided when i was, got back to trying some ft8 i miss having that ram mount with the desk and so the next photo shows my solution for that so then i took the ram mount off of the desk and put it on my new platform and now the rotator is where i want it i've got a little fan there now so i'm more comfortable and then i can take that swivel and put the computer closer to me or stow it for driving so it's given me a lot of uh, options cool i see you've got a fan there that fan is wonderful i I, I have to give credit to uh, um, Mike, Mike, right? Uh, K, K8MRD Radio reviewed that fan. It's blue, not Bluetooth. U, it's USB rechargeable. It has a little light on it and it, uh, it it oscillates and it's got five speeds, I think. It's fantastic. It'll run 30 hours at low speed. And of course, I don't operate that much. And then I can I turn it off when I start driving the car and have the air conditioner going and the charging port is connected to a switchable thing. So it, it charges every time I start the car. And then when I park, the charging turns off, I turn the fan on and it's always ready. I, I, I really like it. It's a good, a good purchase for me. And that's the last of our photos. So we've gone really long here. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. And uh, so We've covered all these photos. Anything else you want to talk about before we uh, call it a, a day? Gosh, if I start talking again, I might not shut up. So I should probably just say, hey, thanks for having me here. I've uh, It's been fun to meet you. I mean, we've been riding for at least a year back and forth. And so it's good to talk to you in person. And uh, I, I look forward to meeting you in person sometime. Thank you, Scott, for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure having you, I think viewers are going to be amazed by your vehicle and again thank you very much all right thanks a lot this is kilo two echo zoo roving reporter for ham talk